Welcome back to ECE 442-542. We are one lecture period away from our second exam. Exam number two is Wednesday. Homework number four is due tonight or due today. And we will have a review session for those of you that can last after class. And that should start roughly at 7 o'clock this evening in the same room. Since this is the lecture before exam number two, we'll review what we are going to be allowing for the process on exam number two. We will go over discrete time realization of a low pass filter and that hopefully will connect maybe why your pole zero mapping approach is not looking quite like what MATLAB was giving you in terms of the numerator or how many of these Z plus one factors you had based on the lecture and what MATLAB is giving and we'll try to talk about that distinction and that's really what I'm meaning by implementation issue. The input data into this filter or controller may not be available at the current time, at the current instant of time. That will then mean that we may want to do what MATLAB is doing which is map the number of zeros at infinity minus one to this factor of z plus one. MATLAB gives you a different result than what we talked about in class where we mapped all of our zeros at infinity to a factor z plus one. So if we had six zeros at infinity, which means we have six more poles than we have zeros in our transfer function, then we would have had z plus one to the sixth power. MATLAB would do z plus 1 to the fifth power in its realization. And then that should finish us up for exam number two material and then we'll go into design specifications and second order poll locations which will be material we'll talk more about obviously after spring break but you'll be thinking about these design specs during spring break. That's the idea. All right. Exam number two process. You'll now be allowed another set of notes if you want. So you have two sheets of notes. You can bring a Z transform table and now I'm giving you two different options. And one of those options is a two page option. The other option is a one page, but you need to decide which transform table you are more comfortable with. The two page actually has a column of Laplace transforms, let's say G of S. It has a time domain expression and then it has a Z transform column. That's the transform table on the exam number two material in the D2L on D2L. Question. Oh, if you want to really bring both, I guess I will allow it. That just means you have five pages to keep track of on the exam, in addition to your exam itself. Oh, now it's getting really involved. Can we bring our own version of the Laplace transform table? Maybe you bring the D... I don't... So you can bring one page of your own Z transforms and none of the others. How's that? You also can have a calculator. You can have a writing instrument. What else are we saying? Now we get into the nose. So we were talking about an indoor voice before class started. These are some more nose. Well, indoor voice is not a no necessarily, but it's no shouting. How's that? No talking or looking around. No calculator sharing. I've had that before. They were passing calculators back and forth and I'm going, no, 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 no. That's not the way we do things. No textbook, no course notes, no computer. Any questions on the process? You've already asked plenty. You can bring both of these forms, Z transforms, and if you want, you could bring your own Z transform table. But let's opt for not all three. How's that? 
just so you don't have so many pages. Here's a review of pole zero mapping. And it's all based on this relationship between S and Z given by Z is equal to E to the ST. Yes. Yes, so what I was meaning by don't bring all three is don't bring exam number one, Z transform, exam number two, Z transform, and your own Z transform tape. I'm allowing two. Two out of three isn't bad, is it? Maybe. All right. Whole zero mapping. We factor H of S or G of S, whatever it is that we're trying to, this is a discrete equivalent approach. We're trying to go from an H of S to an H of Z. We factor our analog transfer function, which I'm now labeling capital H of S. And based on that, we can find our poles and we can find our zeros. And some of those might be complex. That's okay. You still map those complex poles or zeros into complex poles and zeros in the Z plane. And it might be easier to do that in polar form in terms of a mapping approach, maybe. But you map your poles, you map your finite zeros, and then you do your infinite zeros of H of S. And infinite zeros, another way of thinking about infinite zeros, how do you find the number of infinite zeros you have? Or zeros at infinity. I've been told I've been calling these all sorts of things. But I hope it's it's clear that it's the same. How do you find the zeros at infinity or the number? Pardon? It's the difference of order and you have, we're assuming that your denominator order is larger than your numerator and so it's the pole slash zero excess. How many more poles do you have than zeros? You had a denominator, fourth order denominator, and a first order numerator, what's your pole zero excess? Three. And then, based on what we've been doing in class, and I'm assuming you're not doing MATLAB on the exam, then we would map Z plus, or we would have Z plus one raised to the three in our numerator in addition to any zero factors we might have had from the finite zeros. So you can have a mix of factors in the numerator. Some of those are re due to your infinite zeros, and some of those factors could be due to your finite zeros in H of X. It's not just one or the other. It can be a combination of both types of zeros, finite zeros and infinite zeros. And then you match the gains of H of S and H of Z if H of S is low pass in nature, you would probably match gains at DC. S equals zero, Z equals one. If H of S is more of a high pass, meaning it's constant at high frequencies, then you might look at S marching off to infinity for H of S and setting that equal to H of Z with Z equal to minus one, which is halfway around the unit circle. That's the highest frequency in the Z point is z equal to minus one. And that's what we will map our infinite behavior to. Here's what we've talked about in class, although this one, maybe now I have an a in the numerator. I don't know, did last time I just have a one in the numerator? I don't remember. What's the DC gain of g of s? So when s is equal to zero, it's a over a, it's one. We have a pole zero excess of one, and we have a pole at minus a and no finite zero. And we could then say, oh, we have a pole zero excess of one. We should have one z plus one factor in the numerator. We have a pole factor of z minus e to the minus a t. And then we matched gains at dc and found our gain to be 1 minus e to the minus a t over 2. And that's what I'm trying to do here for g sub d. This should all be reviewed. What we want to talk about now is how do we take that into a time domain realization? What's the application? 
if this is a low pass filter, can we turn this into a difference equation, which we can now program into our computer, and somebody will give us a string of numbers or a sequence of numbers, and we can low pass filter it with this particular difference equation. You give me a number, I'll prop put it into the difference equation. Another number, I'll put it in, and out will come our output, and that will be the filtered version of our input sequence of numbers. So let's create a difference equation from this discrete equivalent of a low-pass filter. g sub d of z, which it doesn't really matter what letters you do for a ratio, but here let me just say my output is y and my input is r to this filter, and I now know that that's this 1 minus e to the minus a t over 2 times z plus 1 over z minus e to the minus a t. And if I want to create a difference equation based on g sub d of z that relates y of n to r of n, and just based on this expression, can you tell me how many terms in, let's say, y of n and y of n minus n, or y of n minus 1, y of n minus 2, you might expect in that difference equation? How many n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3 terms will you expect in your time domain difference equation? Let's say we start with y of n. Do we have an n my, y of n minus 1? Do we have a y of n minus 2 term, generically? And how do we find that? Well, if you looked at this, what's the order of this transfer function? The order is determined by the power or the order of the denominator polynomial. What's the order of the denominator polynomial? What's the power of the, or what's the highest power of z in the denominator? 1, right? We have z to the 1. So this is first order. First order, we should expect a y of n equals something y to the n minus 1, and we shouldn't have any more y terms. We shouldn't have a y of n minus 2, a y of n minus 3. That would correspond to a second order and a third order, respectively, and we just have a first order. In order to find these y of n minus 1s, y of n minus 2s, we really need to express g sub d in terms of z to the minus 1s instead of z's. And we can obtain that since it's first order, I can multiply by 1, where 1 is z to the minus 1 over z to the minus 1. If it was nth order, I would multiply by z to the minus n over z to the minus n. Here, little n is 1. If I distribute that z to the minus 1 throughout, I now end up with y of z over r of z equaling this gain value, 1 minus e to the minus a t over 2. And for a given sampling period, capital T, and a bandwidth of my low-pass filter, which is determined by A, that will just be a constant number, what's in square brackets. In the numerator, I have z times z to the minus 1, which is 1, plus 1 times z to the minus 1, or z to the minus 1. Downstairs, I have 1 plus e to the minus a t, z to the minus 1. This is now in a form that makes it easier to go directly into the time domain. Question? This may be a long night. The question was, can you check your sign, please? No, that wasn't the question. It was a much nicer question than that. It was, shouldn't that be z to the minus? Yes, it should be. <laughs> 
So somehow I dropped that or I added a vertical line in the denominator operation, which should have been a negative. Now we can go into the time domain. And the time domain, we simply cross multiply by that denominator term, 1 minus e to the minus a t z to the minus 1, that 1, and I'm now inverse z transforming, I would have capital Y of z taken into the time domain becomes Y of n, and I'm going to go ahead and inverse z transform and put all the other terms on the right hand side. Meaning, I now have e to the minus a t y of n minus 1. And this piece came about from that guy relative to scaling by y of z, or operating on y of z. And then I have the rest, which is going to be this gain, 1 minus e to the minus a t over 2 times... R of n, that's coming from that guy. And I have a plus R of n minus 1, which is coming from that piece. And they both are getting scaled by that square bracketed number. What we want to do now is really sort of relate what's happening or what time instant each of these outputs and inputs to this difference equation. This is a difference equation and that's a low pass filter. You give me a sequence of inputs, R of n's, and I can now plug those into this equation and out will come a filtered version of that input sequence. Y of n will be a filtered version. And what's it doing? It's really just averaging. It's Keeping, it has some memory, that's e to the minus a t, scaling the previous y that we just filtered, and then it's averaging our most recent input and the one before that, and putting that to create the next output value y of n. But this guy, y of n, is the output... at time little n, or what I might call now. That's happening at the current time, that's now. This guy is the output at one time period before, at time n minus 1. Question? So the question was, if we are, well, the question was, if we average more of our input values, will that be an advantage? What, are we, what was the order of this filter to begin with? First order. So if we made a higher order filter, what would that allow us to do? Do you remember in the analog, let's say the Butterworth filter, if we wanted a sharper roll-off, that would be we need to increase the order of our filter. So we could get a stronger and maybe a flatter, so we would get a flatter pass band and a sharper roll-off in the stop band if we had a higher order filter. And that's really what you're asked, saying now. If we sort of kept track of more, or we, we remembered more terms, and we started averaging more, we might get a better behavior. And yes, you will but we're not going to do that based on this G of S that we started with. This G of S was forcing our hand as far as what we are going to implement. Yes. This, I ran out of highlight color, so let me, whoops. The question was, where did this come from? 
So that came from this guy getting put over to here and then moving it to the other side of my equality in the time domain. I have minus e to the minus a t, z to the minus 1 times capital Y of z. I inverse z transform and then I push it to the right hand side and that gives me the e to the minus a t y of n minus 1. Is that clear? Now let me remind us of what we have relative to the time values. What, when is this input in time? This is an obvious question. This is now the input at time what? Now or at time n. What about this input? That's now the input at the previous sample period, n minus 1. So what this is saying, in this implementation, we mapped our infinite 0 to this factor z plus 1 and that actually gave rise to us seeing two terms of our input an r of n and an r of n minus 1 but if we were implementing this that says that the output if this was a controller in implementing this in a real system this if this was some controller it would say oh right now in order to inject information into my system uh, it's called that y of n I need to have access and immediately I have to have r of n I have to have the input at the present time what if I don't have that what if there's some delay between when I sample the input and when I can actually push it through and apply it to the system maybe I don't have access to r of n now when I need the output now is that making any sense? If you think of how you do this, you're now scaling a previous output with this factor, e to the minus at. That's some r. Well, you can do that between n minus 1 and now. You can do that computation. On the right-hand side, or in the right-hand sides, you already have the previous input, r of n minus 1, and you could scale that with this factor quantity 1 minus e to the minus a t over 2 and keep that ready to go. So you could combine that piece with this y of n minus 1 piece and have that just sitting in a stored location. But now we're saying you need to instantly measure the input, scale it, add it to that and put it to the output. Now, right, at n, that's what this is saying. Maybe we can't do that. Maybe we can't make that happen now. Now, in reality, if that takes you maybe 10 or 20 percent of your sample period, that's probably okay. But if it's delayed any more than that, you probably want to maybe say, I really don't have access to my input now when I'm trying to create the output now. Meaning, maybe we want to force a one sample period delay in our implementation between the input and the output. That's what I'm trying to say. Let me now write that down in terms of what I'm going to call implementation issues. Or it's just one issue that I'm talking about. And this is related to this concept of the zeros at infinity. And when the input is available to be applied to our creation of the output y of n. Let me try to write down what I tried to describe so that when you go back, you can say, I don't remember what he said, and you won't have to listen to the YouTube. You can just read it, okay? So if the input, in our 
right on cue, 555, we have somebody stapling posters outside our... I don't know if you can hear that on YouTube. You'll have to tell me if you're listening to this. But if the input at the present time, that's the R of N, if the input at the present time which we are now saying T is little n capital T or IE in our notation that was R of n. If that is not available in the implementation of the digital system. That's this difference equation. So if we don't have y, R of n when we need to generate Y of n, then one of the zeros at infinity, if we had three of those, then now we would remove one of those. Then one of the zeros at infinity needs to be mapped actually to z equal infinity. We need to keep a zero at infinity in our g of z or in our h of z. And we need one of those if we want a one sample period difference between our output of that transfer function and when we have access to the input. Or stated another way, that is only map and here let me see if we can get the notation, the number of zeros at infinity minus one is equal minus 1. And we're doing that in our transfer function that we were calling in g sub d of z. And if you've already completed your homework assignment, homework number 4, you will see that that's actually what MATLAB is doing. If you had four zeros at infinity, it only maps three of those to this factor z plus 1. If you had two zeros at infinity, it's only going to give you one factor, z plus one. This is what I'm going to call the MATLAB approach. And why is it doing that? Well, it's forcing then a one sample period delay between your input and your output. That's the reason it's doing one less than the actual number of zeros at infinity in your transfer function. Let's go through that for this low-pass filter of first order just to compare and maybe this would be what you would compare with MATLAB and get the same answer that MATLAB might produce. We return to our low-pass filter new, let's call this the new g sub d of z so I'll put a bar over it and now we have some gain k bar and we had a z plus 1 over z minus e to the minus a t. How many zeros at infinity do we have in g of s? Or, what's another way of saying that? What's the pole zero excess? How many poles do you have in g of s? How many finite zeros do you have in G of S? None. So what's your pole zero excess in G of S? One. So how many zeros at infinity do you have? One. If this was A over S plus A times S plus three, then what would your pole zero excess be? Two. In this case, in our example, to be consistent with the earlier case, we have a pole zero excess of one, we have one zero at infinity. So that means using this approach, saying, oh, for implementation purposes, let's enforce 
a one sample period delay between the input and the output. So let's not map all of those zeros at infinity to this factor z plus one. Let's actually map one of those to a zero at infinity, which means that we essentially throw that piece away. We remove one zero at infinity. And now we can find, and now do you see that the k bar is going to be different? Because we've just thrown away two if we matched gains at dc. Because we had z equal to one at dc, and now we're throwing that away. Let's now find k for this new structure of g sub d of z, which is g sub d bar. Yes. So now the question was, why are you trying to confuse me a day before the exam? Did I paraphrase that properly? So here's the approach that I said, and now I'm saying, can we relate what this is giving us with what MATLAB gave us? Because I'm not get, seeing the same thing. And why is MATLAB maybe different? It can't be wrong. And I can't be wrong, right? Mat what? what we were told in class. Well, this is what we did in class, but now what we're saying is we're modifying step number four. It's exactly the same process, except now if on the exam I said, I want you to force a one sample period delay between the input and the output, then alarm bells would ring in your head and you would go, oh, we need to worry about number four in this process. And we would say, I have three zeros at infinity. How many factors of z plus one do I use in my numerator? Two. So I force one zero at infinity in my new g sub d of z. Yes. So now the question was, if you want more delays between the input and the output, you can force more zeros at infinity. You would say, oh, I want two. So now I want two zeros at infinity. Here I'm just saying, let's just live with one. So we're assuming that we can do all of our processing in that one short interval of time of one sample period. And then we can spit out the output. Was there another question? One, two, and then three. Yes. So the question is, are we doing this because the this example that's now on the screen doesn't work? No, this works fine. It's just if you can measure the current input and quickly, within 10% of a sample period, spit that out and create your output, you're probably okay using this approach. If you're number crunching and you measure the input and it takes you 80% of the sample period, then you probably want to force a sample period and then the equations will be better in terms of the implementation. The, the processing will work better because now you're actually saying, oh, I'm enforcing a one sample period delay. It really is more of a practical implementation concern. On the exam, we'll probably just live with this approach. You have three poles at infinity, I'm sorry, three zeros at infinity, you have z plus one cubed. No, in MATLAB, this is only going to be for the pole zero matching point. I think it says in quotes matched, does it not? So that's the one that it's doing this for. And you'll see this discrepancy of you'll be missing a z plus 1 factor when you do it in MATLAB. Duncan.
So I haven't yet made it there. The question was, would you hurry up, please? Maybe. So here, if I go down to this, are we fine with what I've done so far? I've basically eliminated one of the z plus 1 factors. If I had a z plus 1 squared, my denominator would be bigger in order, then I would keep one of those z plus 1 factors if I just wanted to throw or enforce a one sample period delay. Here we're enforcing a one sample period delay, and hopefully you will see that now k bar is different. We're matching the gains. We now have g sub d of z bar at dc, which is z equal 1, and we want to set that equal to, was this g sub c? No, g, well, sometimes I label it as continuous, but this is now at s equals 0. We're matching the gains at dc. Our g sub d bar is now just k bar over 1 minus e to the minus a t. That's plugging in z equal 1, and I've canceled, I've eliminated that z plus 1 factor, and that's equal to a dc gain of 1, which is what the low-pass filter, I haven't changed my original low-pass filter. That hasn't changed at all. I'm still trying to uh, equivalent or find a discrete equivalent for that. But now what's my k-bar? k-bar is now just 1 minus e to the minus at. So that g sub d bar of z is now 1 minus e to the minus at times 1 over 1 z minus e to the minus a t. And if I wanted to take that into the time domain, then maybe I would change my z's to z to the minus 1 powers, and it's only first order, so I'm just having to scale by z to the minus 1 over z to the minus 1. But do you already see there's a 2 missing in the denominator of my gain? I cut my gain in half. And that's influencing the way that the input is weighted as it comes in to form the output y. So that y of z over r of z is now 1 minus e to the minus a t. That's the gain. And I, I've also forced a z to the minus 1 in the numerator. And I have a 1 minus e to the minus a t, z to the minus 1, downstairs. I want to put that into the time domain so that I can put this into a difference equation in a computer, for example, and now do you see how this will pull in as a difference equation? I will have y of n If I'm consistent with the last one, I think I had this in green. Now do you see what the next piece is? It's now going to be e to the minus a t y of n minus 1. That was this guy. I multiplied inverse c transformed and put it to the other side, and now I have my input pieces. How many input pieces do I have? What is that factor 1 minus e to the minus a t? That's just one number, isn't it? Although it's spread out because it's a 1 minus, but that's just a gain. That's just a number. How many z to the minus 1s do I have? Or z to the minus 2s or z to the minus 3s? Do you see I just have a z to the minus 1 and I don't have a constant? I have a gain times a z to the minus 1. I don't have a gain times a constant which means I now have thrown out an r at the present time. I just have an r at time n minus 1. And it's gained by 1 minus e to the minus at. Or I now have 1 minus e to the minus at 
times r of n minus 1. which says that the output at the present time at now is only going to be based on the input one time step before. And it's obviously being weighted by twice what the previous R's were. Is that, do you see a difference between this difference equation and the previous difference equation where this one we modified our process. I'm trying not to confuse you before the exam. I'm just trying to make the connection between why is MATLAB giving you a different answer than what we talked about in class. In an exam you have to be on your toes. You have to be reading the question very, very carefully and if I say anything about a delay in your input or forcing some delay between the output of your filter and the input, then you may, may want your ears to stand up and start going, whoa, wait a minute. He's talking, he's messing with this, these zeros at infinity. And we would probably only ensure one delay, so that means let's eliminate one of those z plus one factors in this discrete equivalent process of the pole zero mapping. Why did I remove the factor of two in the denominator? That resulted by matching the gains that 2 didn't appear anymore because I'm still trying to match my gains at DC. I don't want my gains to be different even though the way that I process this information may be a little different. Now I'm not combining the present input and the previous input. Now I'm just using the previous input but I'm still matching the gains at DC. You want to have the same gain at low frequencies in both cases. And this ensures that by matching the gain. So my K bar now is different. And if you found the DC gain of G sub D of Z, what is it? If you plug in Z equal to 1, what are you going to end up with for G sub D at Z equal to 1? 1 minus E to the minus AT divided by 1 minus E to the minus AT, a DC gain of 1, which is what you had for the low pass filter a DC game in the continuous time case. Questions on that? So now the question was, can we simply throw in a delay block in our model we're actually, in order to enforce a delay between the input and the output, we weren't really doing our discrete equivalent in that approach. We were essentially saying, let's start with a continuous time transfer function and take that into the digital domain. We're not playing with block diagrams directly. We're doing it indirectly by saying, let's start with this analog system and put it into a discrete time system. And then we have to decide, oh, is my machinery, is my computational engine fast enough to quickly give me an output when I measure the input now? And if it's not, maybe you need to enforce a delay. And that's why we're now mapping differently these zeros at infinity. Yes. Yes, these are discrete equivalents, which there's, there's an approximation going on in that because we're now what? We're now sampling, and so there's some inherent approximation just because of the sampling process. So now by introducing this delay, we've maybe just made our system respond a little more slowly, but if the sample period is quick, 
and if you wait long enough, what, what do you, you know, what's this error? It's probably imperceivable, the difference between the previous version and this one. But if you get down to it, then this one is not going to respond as quickly to changes in your R input as the previous one, because you're not applying the input now, you're applying it one time step removed. But if your time sample is pretty quick, or pretty short, it's not going to really matter that much. So it's not that significant of a difference. It's just more in the implementation. Yes? So now if you took this one and caused it to wait, you're actually changing the approximation and you're making things worse. Well, it depends on what you mean by wait. If you sort of, uh, it could end up increasing the order of your filter. Did I see another? Okay. Mind changes are allowed. But in, on the exam, you want to make sure that your mind change is in the correct direction, right? And you've probably learned at this point in your career that sometimes your first process is probably the right direction. Sometimes you start second-guessing your own correct work, just saying. Not that that's always the case. Sometimes you do need to make sure that you're in the right place. Other questions? And you can do this with complex poles and zeros, this pole zero mapping approach. And we may talk a little bit more about that in the review session. What I want to do is finish, that's now exam number two material. Now everybody's head goes down, it's on the desk. You've checked out. So I will just talk to myself Nothing unusual there, but let's now talk about design specifications and S-plane pole locations and try to make the connection between maybe what you've seen in the past and what we will be doing in the future. We want to now start moving into designing controllers, and in order to do that, we need to have a handle on what should we be specifying. What should we be specifying our system to behave like? How hard can we push our system? What kind of settling times do we want? Now we're going to be introducing some more terminology. So let's now talk about design specifications. I'm not sure I understood the question. Is the con question about design specifications and second order lo pole locations? Yes, so we'll be talking maybe a little bit about examples here. But if, you, if I don't, if I say a second order system, you can think of a second order RLC circuit. You could think about the mass spring damper system, which is problem two on homework number four. That's a second order system. Now let's talk about the continuous time situation, or here's now continuous time material. And the interesting behavior is actually when we have an underdamped second order system. where now our g of s is omega sub n squared over s squared plus 2 zeta omega sub n s plus omega sub n squared. Or we might parameterize that as sigma squared plus omega sub d squared over s plus sigma squared plus omega sub d squared. And let's now try to relate those to poles in the complex plane. 
how many finite zeros do I have in G of S? How many finite zeros? I have no finite zeros. How many poles do I have in this system? Yes. Is that a two zeta? That's a zeta. That's a Greek symbol. That's a two zeta omega sub n s. So zeta is a new Greek symbol. And what I want to do is show where that is in the complex plane. Meaning, we have a complex plane, and now where are my poles located? Depending on how you're used to seeing this factored, you might see maybe I'm going to get into trouble. So let me just say that here is an arch, and that's not the unit circle. This is a distance, omega sub n, from the origin, our natural frequency away. And let's say that our pole, we have that pole and we have its twin below. These poles are appearing in conjugate pairs. Here, we have this pole is now at S equal minus sigma plus J omega sub D. It has a real part of minus sigma. It has an imaginary part of J omega sub D, or a damped frequency. And relating that to the natural frequency, the natural frequency is actually the hypotenuse of this right triangle, where the right triangle has a real component of sigma. It has an imaginary length or a vertical length of the damped frequency. And the radial distance away from the origin is the natural frequency omega sub n. And you might then see this angle, that's now theta, that's not related to theta sub d, theta sub d in the z plane was measured relative to the positive real axis. This is a theta in the s plane, this is the s plane, and we're now, this is that crazy variable again, there's zeta times omega sub n. And omega sub d, if we wanted to relate it to this hypotenuse, then omega sub d is omega sub n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And all of these you can find relationships for by simply realizing that you have these complex pole pairs at s equal minus sigma plus and minus j omega sub d. And if you wanted to have a lot of damping in your system, then you would want this zeta to be 1, and then you would have two real poles on the two real poles. They're both at minus sigma or minus omega sub n away from the origin. If you had no damping, then you would be up here with zeta equal to zero, and if you plug in zeta equal to zero for your omega sub d formula, you see your damped frequency is exactly the natural frequency. So all you're doing there is shaking at omega sub n with no damping. It's just oscillating because your poles are on the imaginary axis. A zeta value of zero, your purely imaginary poles. A value of zeta equal to one, your purely real poles. And that's critical damping. And anywhere in between is an underdamped system response. Where now we have S is equal to minus sigma plus J omega sub D, or that's minus zeta omega sub N plus and minus, oh no, let me just keep the plus. I'll just concentrate on the one pole that I'm showing in this S plane curve, J omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Terminology wise, sigma, which is zeta omega sub n, I will refer to that as my damping, or the damping in the system. That's how far is this pole into the left half plane. That Greek symbol zeta, 
let me just say colon is my damping ratio. Omega sub n is my natural frequency. And omega sub d, which is omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared, is the damped frequency. And all of this, if you've had 441 or 541, this should all just make you feel warm and fuzzy. This should be very comforting to you. We've You've seen this before. And we can also relate this angle, the pizza wedge size in the S-plane, to this damping ratio zeta. If you look at some trigonometric relationships, what's the cosine of theta? It's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And what's the adjacent? That's zeta omega sub n. What's the hypotenuse? That's omega sub n. So you can relate the angle theta to this damping ratio. Let me just write that down. So the cosine of theta is equal to sigma over omega sub n. That's adjacent over hypotenuse. But sigma is zeta omega sub n in terms of omega sub n, or now cosine of theta is the damping ratio. And theta is equal to the inverse cosine of zeta. So if somebody gives you theta, you can find zeta. And what we want to do now is relate the sigmas, zetas, omega sub n's, omega sub d's to time domain behaviors. So that if somebody says, oh, I want a settling time of this amount, that will tell you what sigma value you need or how far you want your poles into the complex S-plane. And then eventually we'll translate those into Z-plane location because of our familiarity with S-plane to Z-plane mapping approaches. Let's look at the step response of this underdamped second order system. And once I say under damp second order system, that should hopefully make you think about something that looks like this. That's supposed to be cleaner than that, but it has a bump and it also has a final that ooh boy. That's supposed to be centered between those bumps. So I'm gonna have to start over. Oh, be careful. All right, now that I'm there, let me see if I can do the following. That would have been smarter to do it that way anyway, huh? All right, so there are my bumps, and they should be somewhat centered around my final value that I'm going. This is, the blue is my output y of t from that second order system when I apply a constant input. And what I'm interested in is I'm interested in several different locations. I want to know maybe when do I actually get to this first peak, which is y t sub p. That t sub p is then the time that it takes to peak, or I might call that the peak time. I might have a time instance where I'm getting into a 1% tube. Now this is different from what we've had before where we might have said a 2% tube. In this class, let's change that up a little bit. Let's call this a 1% tube. And the first time that it gets into that 1% tube and never leaves is what I will now call my settling time. And I'll say that that's T set. And I'm calling that the 1% settling time. And eventually I will want to know what's the peak relative to where I settle, what's my final value 
let me say this is y final value, and that will give me something I will refer to as the percent overshoot. If I really overshoot where I eventually end up, then I have a high percent overshoot. But first, let's work at the let's look at the first one. Let's look at the peak time. Or if I now, from that particular description, I want to know how do I find y of t and how do I play with that relative to what I've given as far as a second order underdamp system. This is now the inverse Laplace transform of capital Y of S. But that's now the inverse transform. Y of S is just the second order system times the Laplace transform of the input. And I'm going to have just, let's say, a unit step input. So y of s will just become 1 over s, but let's now talk about the time to peak or the peak time. If I gave you a, a formula or an expression for y of t, how could you find the peak time? And now maybe I should go back to this picture and say, how could you find y of t sub p? You're looking for a maximum. And now if you have a maximum from calculus, what do you think about when you hear maximum? Derivative. So now if the derivative is 0, I've hit a maximum or a minimum. But here I'm actually looking for the first maximum beyond t equals 0. So we aren't going to be worrying about the second order derivative. We're just going to find the maximum right after t equals 0. And we'll call it good. And that will be our peak time. We know that we're going to be peaking at that particular instant. Or we're now looking at the derivative equal to 0. And that will give us this time to peak. Knowing that y of t is in blue, what does y prime of t look like? In terms of its Laplace transform, how do I find the derivative of y of t in the frequency domain? If I have capital Y of s, how do I find my hearings going? Now I can hear. Sorry. How do I find the derivative of y if I have capital Y of s? I can multiply by s. So now inside this inverse Laplace transform, let me say y capital Y of s. If I take that one step further, I now have s, but g of s was what? That was this second order transfer function. Now I have to squeeze that in. That was this omega sub n squared over, let's say, s plus sigma squared plus omega sub d squared. That was g of s. And I'm hitting this with a unit step. Here's g of s. What's the Laplace transform of a unit step? That's 1 over s. So this is now my capital U of s. And I hope that you see I have some math that's sort of nice. I now can cancel these s's. But if you go and look at Laplace transform tables, you probably won't see an omega sub n squared in the numerator with a denominator of s plus sigma squared plus omega sub d squared. But I can force an omega sub d in the numerator by multiplying that numerator by 1. Because I want omega sub d over s plus sigma squared plus omega sub d squared. And then that becomes a pure sine wave in the time domain. But now I have some other constants, but those are just numbers. I can pull that out. 
what I have remaining, if I just keep omega sub d in the numerator, I have omega sub n squared divided by omega sub d. Let me pull that out front. And then that's just going to scale this waveform, but I'm really just interested in the time when that waveform peaks, scaled or not. I don't really care. Or I can now say that this derivative of the output is equal to omega sub n squared over omega sub d times the inverse Laplace transform of this exponentially damped sine wave, which is now e to the minus sigma t sine omega sub dt. I am now interested in when that expression, the first time, let's say after t equals zero, that y prime of t equals zero. I want to know when does it reach its maximum. If I want that blue expression to be equal to zero, what do I need to have happen? Omega sub n squared over omega sub d. Do I need to worry about that? It's not a function of time, it's just a constant. That's not going to influence anything really in terms of my time. e to the minus sigma t, what does that do? Does that ever go through zero? No, that just approaches zero in a limit. So that's not going to give us anything exciting in the short time interval. I want to now concentrate on this sine of omega sub dt function. And I want to know when does that first equal zero beyond t equals zero. That would equal zero when t is equal to zero, correct? Sine of zero is zero. I want to have an, an interesting t value, a non-zero t, when that becomes zero, or when the function sine of omega sub dt equals zero. I'm now interested in or want to find sine omega sub d, and I'll call that t sub p when that equals zero. I want to force or select my peak time such that this function sine of omega sub d time to peak is equal to zero. What's the argument on sine need to be in order for that result to give me zero? What's the argument of the sine function when the sine is zero other than when sine when the argument is zero? Pi. So now I need to flip all the way over to pi. So now I'm saying that this implies that omega sub d t sub p is equal to pi. And I apologize, it is getting late, and now we're talking about dessert, but this is pi as far as the, diff, the ratio of circumference to diameter of a circle. Not cherry or peach or apple, pumpkin, mincemeat. Pardon? So now, why didn't we consider the general solution? We just want the first time that this happens. We want to know at what time instance does this reach the peak the first time. We don't want to know every time thereafter. So now we're just wanting to know when is the first argument of sine going to give us the first zero beyond t equals zero, and that's when that argument reaches pi. Not two pi, three pi, rhubarb, oh boy, strawberry rhubarb. Uh, okay, let's move on. So now we have time to peak we can solve for. That's now pi over omega sub d. Or if somebody wanted to, they could say, what's the damped frequency for a given time to peak? If somebody says, oh, this second order underdamped system peaked at time 0.47, now you could tell me what the damped frequency of oscillation is for that second order system. That's one time domain specification. Now we can relate time to peak to omega sub d. And what was omega sub d? 
That was the complex pole's distance away from the real axis. That was how high it was in the vertical direction. The higher it is, the faster your system will peak. Let's look at percent overshoot. This could be the width of that pie that we're now, that wedge shape is what we're relating it to. The percent overshoot is now the y value at the time to peak minus its final value over its final value times 100%. And if you measured that particular curve, you would find y time to peak, you would find its final value, you could compute the percent overshoot. We are going to just now say, well, we can relate percent overshoot if we went through the formulas to our zeta value. And that's going to be 100 e to the minus zeta pi over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So if somebody gives you a second order system response, you could identify the value of the output at the peak time, you could evaluate where it settles, and you could measure the percent overshoot. Vice versa, if somebody said, give me a zeta, I'll give you a percent overshoot, this equation now allows that to happen. We can solve this equation for the percent overshoot, or using, I'm sorry, we can solve this for zeta, so that if somebody says, I want a 10% overshoot, you can tell them what zeta value should be. So let's now solve for zeta. And zeta now becomes this really nice expression. It's the natural log of percent overshoot over 100 squared. There's pi squared, pi times pi, plus natural log squared and you can't forget that one half. If somebody gives you now a percent overshoot, you can now translate that into a zeta value, and if they have a zeta value, you can now figure out what the theta is in the S plane. And you could, on exam number three, you could carry into the exam a curve that allows you to relate the percent overshoot to zeta, and you'll see in that curve that if you had a 50% overshoot, you would actually see, and this is not very well drawn, a zeta value of 0.2. If you had a 10% overshoot, that corresponds to a zeta value of 0.6, and a really nice trade-off between, oh boy, this is a terrible curve relative to what it should be. That's just 0 0.7. All right, so it doesn't look very, that's a 5%. So a nice trade-off between percent overshoot and speed of response or behavior is 5%. And that gets rise to a zeta value of 0.7. What's the inverse cosine of 0.7, 45 degrees roughly. So a 45 degree location for those poles is a nice value to be working with. So we have the cosine of theta is the adjacent over hypotenuse. That's this zeta omega sub n over omega sub n, which is zeta giving us theta is the inverse cosine of zeta, and a zeta of 0 0.7 says that theta is approximately 45 degrees. The only thing we haven't talked about is that tube, the 1% tube, which we can do very quickly, and that's our settling time. The settling time is governed by this exponential, and sigma is related to the time constant, 
in a reciprocal relationship. Here we now have our time constant is in the denominator. And what we will find, or what I will just tell you, is that a 1% settling time corresponds to five time constants. Or if you looked at e to the minus, a time value of five time constants, that's five tau, that's minus five tau over tau. The tau's cancel and you have e to the minus five. That's approximately 0 0.01. So you get within 1% of where you started after five time constants and that's what we will associate with. We'll say a 1% settling time is five tau or a T settle is now 5 tau, which is 5 over sigma, or that's 5 over zeta omega sub n. And we'll have to pick up at that point, but hopefully you see that if you make your pole move further into the left half plane, make sigma bigger, that sigma is in the denominator, you're going to shrink your settling time. So if you want a faster settling time, you pull, push your poles further into the left half plane and we'll see that that's corresponding to in the Z plane, making your closed loop poles get closer and closer to the origin in the Z plane.